them when they're not governed. But I don't know of any of you that you look around in this present world and I don't like what I see. When I look out in this present evil world and you look and see Satan's activity and his policy dragging down a country that was once at least a deistic, at least or a theistic, they understood that there was a God and you know there's people that surmise a bunch about the different aspects of the founding fathers. But to take that original nest egg and that desire and goal and you add a few hundred years and you look and see what it's now, Satan's plan is working well. But there is a foil for Satan's plan, and it's this book. And if we could be wise concerning that which is good and simple concerning evil. But the problem is I've been noticing, and I'm not trying to ramble here, but I've noticed family members, well, family members and people that I know, and you look at their children, and they took kind of a neutral position. They just put the shift lever in neutral, and they float along for a few years, and that few years of floating took their children, because their children, the, the desire and pull on the children didn't go in neutral. It went hyper speed. It dug in and put four-wheel drive and V-bar tire chains and started dragging those children so fast and far away from the parent, where the parents would desire them to be that by the time they realized what was happening, what the hijacking that was going on, their children were damaged massively. And I know that God can pick up the pieces and I thank God for that. But my goal is to be able to have all of us be of one mind because whether you, I think everyone in here has children, if not, you might have a child in the future or you know someone that has a child. <laughs> there we got everybody. So, but when this thing, when you look about children and you see how precious they are and how they're valued in the scripture and how Satan doesn't value them at all. He'll use them up as just refuse and sell them off to child trafficking and vile stuff that I wish didn't happen. I wish you could go, oh, that was a horrible nightmare. I'm glad that doesn't happen. But there is dark, dark, dark influences in this world. And God talks about them in his word, just like the Canaanite cultures. What they did with children, and what they did, just darkness and sacrificing children to Moloch and stuff that you think, there's no way, how can anyone with any shred of conscience do that? It happens by incrementally breaking down the barriers. Nobody in their right mind would do that. No one would think of doing that. Natural affection would say, absolutely never. But that slowly whittling away of something will get them. And I don't know exactly how Sodom and Gomorrah, how their whole thing started, but I saw their downward, just free fall in uh, Ezekiel 16, 49, I think it is, where he says, behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, and who knows the next one? Fullness of bread and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness, and I don't care what nationality, what culture you have, you put those three ingredients in that country and they're going down fast. But what can keep them afloat, what can keep that, that toxic corruption out of it is this book understood. And I, don't, I, could, I could give you far more accounts and illustrations than I even want to because it's a grief of mind. But people that I know Families that I know, that I've known for you know, 10 years or so, you see the neutral position and you see how daughters, how they feel with just, I mean, their, their lives are changed forever and the pieces can be taken and picked up. But daughters are pulled down ways where with tear-filled eyes and sleepless nights they think, ah, oh. in their mind they think, can God ever use me again? Yes, he can. But when fathers kind of put their life on cruise control and mothers don't realize and see the destructive nature of this world, the children suffer. I mean, the parents suffer and the children are even, it's easier to see the working and, and, and influence of Satan on a generation in the children and then you usually see it later on in the parents. But children are an early warning system of danger in life. And I need to make sure I take that to heed. Where you start seeing children, you're like, where did you learn that? Ooh, hmm. And then you realize, ah, oh, these little children are, they're learning, they're mimicking, and they're learning from me. I am their living epistle. 
and grandparents, the children are looking at you. Uncles, uh, you know, nephews, all those things, those little children, those eyes are watching you. And they want to be a lot of times like what they see. But how important it is to be those living epistles known and read of all men. So this thing about what the devil, I don't know, did any of you ever hear years ago, um, Paul Harvey had that thing about if I were the devil? I don't have the thing memorized, but I was just thinking about families, and it'd be healthy for every father here to do that. And just say, if you were the devil, how would you start working on you? How would you want your wife to be altered and changed and a few things? And what would influences you want your children to go into? But not being ignorant of those devices, think it through and realize where the vulnerabilities are of your home and where those vulnerable places are, where the windows are wide open and pedophiles are ready to climb through and where you can grab your spiritual AR-10 with a 50 round drum, you get out of here. But to be able to understand where these damaging influences are coming in, identify them and ideally just like Job with the wisdom that he had, he wanted to build that hedge of protection and have a stronghold around his family. He understood that he kind of knew what they're up to, but in case they curse God in their heart or something, he was already ahead of time making provision and preparation for that day when it came. And when he did it, he had those, that prudent look, long-term look, he had an understanding like the sons of Issachar. They had understanding of the times and they knew what Israel ought to do. We need to have that understanding too and not like what you were talking about, Brother Eric, about being all in what the Rothschilds are doing and how they're sacrificing children, whatever's going on. You don't want to go too much into it, but you don't want your head in the sand. And having an idea of what's going on with the trafficking of children and the massive billion dollar industry it is and taking images of poor little victims and just debauchery things that are so dark, it's just horrible even to speak of those things. But those things are going on. And even if it was just that your children are safe, but you take them out somewhere, be careful, be vigilant, watch over them, because they could be snatched up in a heartbeat and you never see them again, off they go. So not to strike fear and trepidation where there's cannibals hiding around every tree, but what I see is the goal of America to go from a deistic country, just like the Canaanites, where they went so low, where they went to open pedophile cannibalism and sacrifice to Moloch, that's where this country, that's where the God of this world wants this nation to go. And it sounds absurd. It seems like that's absurd. It's way over the top. It's, you know, off the charts. But that's the direct, in my short life, that's the direction I see it going with a breakneck speed and passion toward those things. So understanding what those warning systems are and where some of those things are found. So um, does anyone have any husband or anybody have you noticed some influence, people that you've known or people you've heard of, and there's certain shipwrecks. Does anyone have a thought of different ways or things that they've heard of, how children were shipwrecked or husbands or wives? Anyone have any examples that you can think of? Yes, Eric? The main ones are music and Hollywood. That is powerful. The eyes and the ears, and we can blend them together. It is extremely powerful. And that's why you think, well, a little bit of syncopation, a little bit of backbeat, it's not a big deal. But even like that old wretch uh, Chuck Berry, he was singing, if it's got a backbeat, he can use it. Well, what was his plan? Deg degradation and vile perversion and lasciviousness just filled that poor guy's life. And he'd sing about, he'd, uh, he'd get a backbeat and he could use it and then uh, it helps him forget about the days of old. Whereas a young child, he, I don't know what influence he had, but he was at some church learning some things about the Bible, whatever it was. But he liked that music because it helped him forget about those days of old where his conscience as a little boy was starting to be revived. And he's like, no, I'm shutting you down. I'm going to get lost in the music and rock out. But that music, you think it's not too big of a deal. It's not a real big thing, but it is big. And there's a spirit behind it that's extremely powerful. It's that spirit of like intoxicating rebellion. And after a little while, someone listening to some music and they're faced with an option, my music or what my mom and dad say, they say, bye mom and dad, I'm going with my friends and with my music. You think, there's no way that would happen. And I've seen it happen and it's sad, but those influences are powerful and definitely do not underestimate them because they're out there and they'll grab up a son or a daughter so fast that you will just be like, um, uh, Esau's parents, it was a grief of mind, the decisions that Esau took, and it, it is rough. It's, 
it's ferocious out there. So anyway, if you, uh, if you take your Bible and turn with me over to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. So we, we heard the thing about music and movies and stuff. Does anyone else have a thought or anyone else experience, or even in your own life, when you're younger, different influence that we're pushing heavily upon you? Yes. That is extremely powerful. You're getting the toxic venom right from the platform of teaching. The whole system is built like Brother um, Barney mentioned about John Dewey and the public indoctrination and destructive implementation. And I was learning about that, that he was over in Russia before the Red Terror, preparing over there for the Bolshevik Revolution, the bloodshed that went over there. And he brought that same stuff over, I think it was 1931, with help of the Rockefeller Foundation, to just start shaking this country to the ground. And why would you, it doesn't even make sense logically, why would you go in and fight bullets and have guerrilla warfare and all the infrastructure being destroyed? All you need to do is start changing the mind of the children that you're against and wait it out a little bit. And you get a couple little stragglers, you can easily get rid of them later on. But understanding what Satan is going and attacking the children with public indoctrination, it is extremely powerful. I heard a guy once say he, it was Stuart Crane, if anyone's ever heard of him. He was talking about economics and he was talking about the public school. And he said, a man came up and with tears in his eyes, he said, Dr. Crane, he said, I have three sons. The first one went off to college and he's a moral wreck. And the other ones went and they all turned out the same way. He said, well, the first one was their problem. And I thought, ooh, that's pretty crude. But he says, the other two were your problem. And I thought, that is fierce. It's, it's not beating around the bush. It's putting it right down, whatever, I'm trying to think of some sport. I didn't play sports growing up, but right down the center of the goalpost. I don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm speaking beyond my understanding here on that one. But anyway, but understanding what those things are, because they're powerful, and they will influence children, and it'll pull them away. So did anyone else? I thought I saw one more hand. Yes. Uh, video games. Ah, yep. And also, how would you have time to play video games unless you had abundance of idleness? Yeah. Ezekiel 16. So, did, and... Yeah, another uh, influence on that is uh, because of access to the internet, sometimes they stumble upon pornography or something. Yep. Yeah, that is another extremely crippling one. Yes. Yep. Yeah, the self-righteousness. Yep. And it could be that religion of where you try to clean yourself up, or it could be like the religion of Diana, of the Ephesians, and all that debauched stuff that went along. You've got a multitude of choices out there, but they're all bad. Yep. Yes. For the art. Yep. Yes, Justin. Yep. Yeah, the, the true negativity of even when you get discernment from the Bible, the sure negativity of staring too closely at the negativity of politics and the world itself, just that, that can drag things down. It can, it can affect the father, and then the father cannot be there because he's too consumed with the negativity of the course of this world rather than realizing that his that's right. And even something perfectly fine like work. But maybe you don't need to work as much or maybe you didn't need a shiny of thing or maybe you could have avoided the compounding interest on whatever that thing may have been. Well, I got to provide for the family. Yes, you do have to do that. But sometimes we might want something shiny or fancy than we need that puts us in bondage where we don't have the time to be like that nursing mother and cherish those children and to be able to invest in them. And that's, I mean, I have to admit, it's so easy when you get work and you know, you got to get done, you could easily just put the whole day, invest the whole thing, and you come back and the children are asleep, you think, hmm, I got to see them this morning. But to be able to gauge those things and realize their short little lives are growing up, go by like a rocket ship going by. And I can't speak from too much experience because my oldest is only nine. But I know people that have older children than mine or grown up children, 
the time whistles by and the time to invest and train goes by rapidly. So, yeah, all those things are extremely important and learning and seeing not not sweeping well so and so his family just the children turned out horrible well he just had bad ones somehow he got bad ones you know but ours it's not like it's just dumped on you every child has a flesh they have flesh and here comes a temptation and they can with what they know about the bible they can either give into it they can yield to it or they can say no i'm going to cast that imagination down by the grace of god and avoid those things but it, it comes down similar to caleb and joshua they're up against foes that it's impossible. No one in their right mind. You're up against giants in fortified cities and strongholds. And Caleb and Joshua, with believing the understanding that God gave them, they said something that didn't even make sense. We be well able. Is it possible to bring up children in the nurture and admonition of the world today? It's impossible. You see crash and burn all over the place. Is it possible? No, but it is possible with this book with men, with women who value this book more than entertainment, who value it more than the things that they like to do or looking at videos or whatever it may be, but valuing the children. And I see the, the reduction of valuing of the children. I've heard different people saying, you probably heard it too. Well, they'll make light and it's not even a positive or beneficial way. They'll say like, grandchildren are your blessing of you not killing your own children or something. It's like, ha ha ha. But right away, I mean, it's coming out of the heart, and you can see why some people would say it, but the goal is to nurture and cher cherish those children. It's not like they're, oh, I got this cursed child, now I gotta sit and waste my 18 years till I can tell the thing, get out of here and go beat it and do it on your own. But looking at them as the mo one of the most valuable commodities that you have, and not manipulating and telling them absolute, but they need those tutors and governors. And even beyond what they need to hear in words, they need to see. And when they see a faithful father, when they see a faithful mother, and they see their siblings being trained and nurtured by godly women and God, well, not plural, a godly man and a godly woman, they can see those epistles and it can go like little Timothy from a child having those strengths put within his heart as a young age. And then here comes more truth. It could be built upon that solid foundation and they were fit and he could take, as it were, that faithful word that he had been taught and he was able, like Titus, to go into Crete in that wicked debauchery and exhort and convince the gainsayers. And with the truth he had, he could ordain elders in every city as I have commanded them. And he goes through those things that God was able to take those dark, corrupted, vile societies and have the word of Christ start dwelling in them richly and changing and transforming them from the inside out. And that's exact, I know God can do that today. America is no darker, or more, no more debauched than Ephesus was or Corinth or Thessaloniki and all those places. They all were dark and God's word is the solution. And I see, I don't know, I mean, men here, when you look at this many children, it's rare to see this many children in one spot. And it's healthy and it's great, I love to see it. But yeah, I can't help but think, where are these 100 plus children what are they going to be doing in a hundred years? And maybe if I am portraying myself in a way that might be negative to some little boy and said, well, I saw Brother Billy do this, this, and this. And, and then they use it as a occasion for them to stumble. It helps me to realize, wow, we are those living epistles and we need to conduct ourselves accordingly. And this book gives us everything that's required for us to be able to accomplish that. So, all right, well, let me get here and read in 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, I'll start with verse number 5. It says, Now he that hath wrought for us the selfsame thing as God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, where, wherefore, we la wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, for, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are, we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also made manifest in your consciences. But this thing about, uh, in verse number, 
Well, verse number eight. We're confident, I say, willing rather to be absent in the body, present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. And now, are we accepted in the beloved? Yes, by the righteousness and grace of God. But to be accepted of him, you can be a, a workman that's a shame in 2 Timothy 2.15. But if you put your life in neutral, I've heard some people where they just, well, it's like God is somehow, they just go to sleep and somehow they wake up knowing more of the scripture. Studying is a work. You open this book, it takes time. You have to willingly say, these hands that we're going to go do something else? No, you're not going to do that. You're going to handle the word of truth. These eyes that would like to maybe look at something else, you tell it no. And just like in Psalm chapter 2, uh, when, or Psalm 1, blessed is the man that walketh not. That blessed godly man is one that can tell this thing, you're not going to do that. And do we have power to keep doing that in the flesh? No, you run out of steam. But the power of Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit has plenty of steam. Amen. It has enough to have this thing mortified in Galatians 2.20 and stay there. Amen. I mean, it's completely possible. It's that Caleb and Joshua, you read this book, we be well able. Like over in Philippians 4, what are those things we can do through Christ? That whole list of the information above, all that is possible to do through the power of God's word through the church, the body of Christ. So he's taking these things about walking worthy and laboring. If you can labor together and have a ministry with your children, if you could go, I know now it's so messed up with the government overreach or COVID or you know, all that kind of stuff that a lot of the nursing homes were shut down. But if you can have a spot where the little children can come in and sing to those, some of those shut-ins. And as a father, if you don't feel comfortable with preaching a message, you can sing a scripture song or something about salvation and then just expound on it a little bit. And the children can be there and they can start nurturing and cherishing a desire in their heart to be a servant because we have a whole lot of selfishness out in this world. It's like in, when you're reading through it, they're lovers of selfies more than, I mean, lovers of self, you know, pleasure and lovers of self more than lovers of God. But the whole thing about self, 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 that's a way of destruction. Where if as, as a young boy, as a young child, they can learn it's not I, it's serving, it's cleaning up, it's doing what mommy and daddy say. And from a young age, I read a, a um, someone wrote an article about how had preparing your son to be ready against pornography and stuff starts when they're still in diapers. And it starts with the ability of that little child to be able to be told no, and he does it. You're not touching this. And he goes over to do it. And at a young age, he can have practice say, he learns this thing is gonna be subservient to what mommy and daddy say. And from a young age, they can realize no means no. So when they get older, they can realize it is possible to tell this thing no. It doesn't have to take and hijack me and pull me everywhere it needs to go. Because after salvation, we're not over grace, we're under grace. And the grace of God teaches us in Titus chapter two, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. And those things are completely capable and possible. Now, in, uh, if you take your Bibles and go over to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. I, I have to admit that having my children come along, certain things I don't have them come along because just having an idea of what's going on in this world, if you're at some rally where there's some pride kind of people and they don't like what your sign says, they can say, hi, this person over here is doing such and such to their children and throw out some lie and now you have got a huge mess on your hands. So being prudent, some of those times I won't bring along children and it's not a sound place to bring them. But sometimes it is. If it's a safe place, you can have them out and there's little children, even though they're not ready to take on any opposition, they can hear what mommy and daddy or other people from the assembly, as they're dealing with lost people, how the scripture works, they can learn how those passages work. And they can see the opposition. They can say, that person's life looks like this. And mommy and daddy's life looks like this. Hmm, I like the way mommy and daddy are going. And they can see those things from a young age. And the scripture can help them to be a better judge of character and to be a better judge within their own heart when they know they're starting to drift or think ways that they shouldn't think. The word of God can bring them back in and have a nice safe place for them to be nurtured and admonished in the Lord. So in Ephesians chapter four, look with me at verse number one. He says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, 
And as fathers, when you think about Paul being, as it were, a nursing mother, I did not realize how much my mom went through. Because when I was young, it's all about me. And I don't even remember what I was like back then. But they're little children. It's not like they're, like Paul Washer says, they're wicked as the devil when they're born. And they'll kill you in cold blood with a dagger. And they'll leave your lifeless body as they walk out the door as a little in their diapers. I was like, I don't know what, what kind of vaccines your children receive. No, I'm just kidding. But, I mean, when you think, they, they paint children like there's some horrible, violent, wretched people. But they're little children. They have a lot of needs. They can't fulfill. They can't go get their own food. They can't control what comes out of their body. So they need to be nurtured. But a mother, night and day, the little thing needs a little extra food and diaper change. And ideally, fathers help out and just don't leave all the things on the mother. But they're such needy little creatures. They need a lot of help. They need a lot of care. They need a lot of nourishment. And Paul realized, just as members of the body of Christ, he could deal with brothers as a nursing mother. And laboring, the more, the more I labor, or the, the more I love thee, the less I be loved. I can't even remember how that verse goes. But he was willing to give of himself, to be spend, spend and be spent for those saints. And to spend and be spent, not for your children because they want to buy every new little flashy thing, but invest time in and love them. Do projects together. And even something simple like making a scripture sign. My children are like, woo, this is just great. They get their markers. And they go outside the lines and stuff, but they're learning. But they get to have a part of it. And as you lift up the scripture sign, people can read about salvation in Christ Jesus. They can say, oh, I'm thankful I got to have a little part of that. It, kind of, it gives them a little, their extra little footprint or a little taste of being in the battle. But bringing children and integrating them into life. Today, it's I'm doing my stuff. The dad is over there doing his thing. The mom is over doing whatever. And the children are left idleness of mind. And then they talk to their enemies. It's not friends. Usually they get counsel from enemies. And the counsel they give them would be counsel that would come out of the worst venomous enemy you can imagine. And it can come fast. So um, phones, I didn't, maybe I didn't mention phones. But those things are extremely productive tools. I mean, they can be used right. But children, I see some children run around. And if you let your children have phones, it's not, I'm not trying to let you have it. But I've seen so many families where, oh, my children will never do that. And five years later, how did this happen? And then they find, maybe the daughter finally spills the beans. Yeah, this boy, he was texting me all night long. And do you, have you ever done this corruption to yourself? I never even heard of that. And they prime the minds of these women, young ladies, silly ladies or silly women. And they prime them. and They just predatorize on them and put all this junk in their mind until they break them down so much. They use them up like some cheap piece of toilet paper and they're off for another victim. And you think, how did that happen? And the poor, sorry goof that can't even hardly tie a shoe, can't even put a sentence together, right. told your daughter a bunch of lies and dumbness, wooed her heart, and now she's got all sorts of problems in her life. So anyway, but to be able to say no. And of course, some people, if their children get old and they have to have a phone for safety, but phones, I've seen it be so detrimental were un, unrestrained phones and children on there. There's so much stuff on there that it wasn't, I mean, they weren't looking on phones like that when I was that age, because of course there wasn't any, at least none that I know of. But those things, these influences are strong and it's good not to be ignorant of those devices. But this thing about walking worthy, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit with the bond of peace and having that bond in a family where you work together, where sons and fathers are working together and daughters and fathers, where there's that close bond, where that heart from a child can willingly be given to a parent because they know you love them and care for them and you want the best for them. They can willingly trust you and tell you what they're thinking. Hey, Daddy, I was thinking of going doing this. Or they can be open where they'll tell you. So often today, children will be open. Daughters will tell other young girls every thought and every feeling in their mind. And when it comes to their parents, the parents have no clue what they're just elaborating on on social media and they're spilling every thought that they think and what they think of some predator boy or whoever it may be. But they open themselves up and those kind of channels need to be watched for and shut down before they start going the wrong direction. Now, how long do I have, Brother Barney? I... Uh, an hour. Okay. Whenever you start it out. Okay. Uh-oh. That crotch is going to... Okay, 
All right, well, turn your Bibles. Let's go over to, we're in Ephesians. We'll go over to Colossians. Go back to Colossians. Or, sorry. I have, my Bible is getting a little bit worn out, but it has come apart a little bit, but it hasn't come apart that much where Colossians is before Ephesians. But in Colossians 1, and look with me at verse number 9. Colossians 1, 9. It says, For this cause also, or for this cause, we also, since the day we heard of it, or heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Children today need that spiritual understanding and they need parents who labor in the word and doctrine, who spend that time studying and then bring them right alongside of them and teach them that thing. So verse number 10, it says, that ye may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful, and that's what we want. As believers, we want our walk and our life in Christ to be fruitful, bring forth fruit. And as parents, as we have children, the fruit of our marriage, those children, we want them to be able to be fruitful. And if you think about the influence that you and I had when we were younger, and you think, well, what kind of toxic influences came to get us? Ramp that up probably by 500, because that's what's coming around today. And think about different ways that if you had idle time, how you were tempted, think about your child and to be able to fortify and protect them from those same things. And as they get older, just no for a young child is plenty fine. They don't, if you're going to explain to a two-year-old why you said no, that's going to be over what they're beyond their understanding level. But as they get older, it's great to tell them, mommy doesn't dress like this. Why? Because there's Ted Bundy people around and other things. Or even if it wasn't because of temptation of the plumber murderer goof or something grabbing that, it comes down to maybe it's a stumbling block for a brother in the assembly. If mom is walking around wearing something that's super short and squeezy, and then the next generation of the girl comes along, well, now it's going to be no. Now we're going to have on mod more mod It's going to naturally start sloping down more and more. And not to be some legalist and say, you're wicked as the devil because your shirt is a different color than mine. The goal is it's not comparing themselves among themselves. That goal of being chaste that goal of modest apparel protects an assembly. It puts a hedge of protection and a fortifying wall around young women. And it puts a protection around mothers. And it teaches from a godly example of a, of, of a lady that has that humbleness and lowliness of mind, that has their husband as the head and the guide, and things are working as it's supposed to be in, an, in, in a family. It gives that child a safe, nurtured place to realize, hey, this isn't so bad. To be a peculiar person doesn't take a whole lot to be a peculiar person these days, but peculiar for a purpose and have the children understand, here's the reason why we don't go here. Here's the reason why we do do this. And we abstain from these things because it's detrimental and it's, it's negative and it's very destructive. And the children can start to see, as they get older, they can start to see unrestrained lives just put neutral or cruise control. It's not going to be pretty, but it's a war. It's a battle. I, I, I enjoy hearing about those spiritual principalities and powers. They haven't gone on sabbatical for 2000 years. Says, ah, oh, we're going to backslide. We're done with this. They've been ramping up their energy and their vitriol against the cause of Christ ever since. So we need to make sure that we're not ignorant of those things. So I mentioned that thing about Caleb and Joshua, about we be well able. Yes. The more of this book we learn and the more we can exemplify those things, the better it is for our children. So I, had, I jotted down a few things about things that we can do through the power of Christ working through us. We, number one, through the scripture, we can be zealous of good works in Titus 2.14. That's exactly, it's completely possible and casting down imaginations. That, yes, the power of Christ in his word, here comes a bad thought in there, you can cast that thing down and it's done. Just give it a body slam. And a workman that needs not to be ashamed. Can we do that? Yes. yes, we absolutely can do that. We can labor, we can study. And that thing about studying to be quiet, as you look around and there's turmoil and, and all sorts of looming wars and all these things, that quietness and consolation from studying this book can not only fill you, but it can be an outpouring to other people. And they say, I'm afraid. What if some suitcase nuke comes by? And you can tell them, hey, I once was afraid of that too. And now if it happens, well, all they can do is just blow me to my eternal home with my blessed Savior who loved me and gave himself for me. So this thing about being able to put off all these. God didn't say for you to do these things because you don't have the ability to do them. 
He said, put off all these anger, wrath, malice, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing you've put off the old man with his deeds. All those things, those toxic influences that damage fathers, mothers, and children can be put off by this book, Reigning and Ruling. It sits in the preeminent position and we say, yes, what wilt thou have me to do? And instead of, we will not have this man rule over us, we will not have this book reign over us, it's we come to it and yes, I want to be subject to it and this is what needs to rule my life. And it will. The peace of God and the understanding from that book can guide us and it's information beyond the most elevated human level. And that's the wisdom that's from above. All right. Now, if you want to take your Bible and let's turn over to Philippians 2. You probably know exactly where I'm going with that. But culturing and cultivating, not culture, there's enough of that stuff out there. It's growing out of control. But to be able to cultivate a mind that is able to have itself fixed toward the things of God. In Philippians chapter 2, we'll pick up at verse 4. Philippians 2, 4. Well, let's look at 3. It says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man unto his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of man, or who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And of course it doesn't end there, but because of that, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So this thing about being found in fashion as a man, God was willing to come down, humble himself for a plan and purpose. And he could look through the toil and the temptation and stuff of this world, and he, for the prize that was set before him, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. He could have that eternal perspective in the roar of the multitudes. He could look right on past that, and he had a goal, and he was going to accomplish that goal. And thanks be to God, he did. And he offered that eternal salvation and offered us the power of that resurrection to be able to dwell within us. And let me, let me run over to, um, if you want to take your Bible, turn over to Leviticus 19. In Leviticus 19, there's a friend of mine and he was taking his daughters to different influences. I told him, I said, I should have been maybe more blunt, but I said, I definitely would not take my daughters over there. But he thought... His daughter needed to learn how to wiggle around and go through dance class and ballet and stuff. And I said, from, I don't know if everyone is doing the same thing, but they definitely don't have you adorned in modest apparel. And you got some little underwear on you and you wing your legs straight up in the air. That is not behavior for any lost young lady or a saved young lady. Oh, well, they, she's going to have hers is going to be a little longer. So that went on for a few years and then crash and burn drunkenness, fornication, just destruction and misery. The parents crying and say, what happened? And I think, mm, what if I was a little more black and white and to the point and say, look, I, have you lost your mind? I, maybe it won't happen to you, but it's not worth the risk. And besides, well, what if, what if she didn't? Well, you know, she learns how to wiggle around and do all these kind of moves like they do in the strip club. Well, that's not something that you want to fall back on. If, if one avenue of employment falls, well, I always can go down. That is not the goal that we want to go. But now with all that stuff, he's trying to pick up the pieces and it wasn't worth it. What, you know, maybe she got to stretch her legs a little more than somewhere else, but the toxicity of being around those other gals, giving influences and then texting them and them talking about their boyfriend and all this negative stuff drug her down so fast that hopefully some of the pieces can be kind of piled back up. But I was reading through uh, over here in, in Leviticus one time, and it, it is so accurate and appropriate. And it's, it's almost like it's, again, way over the top, but it is very important. So let me read this verse here. It's Leviticus 19. And look with me at verse number 29. And God knew that the nation Israel... They're redeemed by blood, as it were, over the doorpost, delivered through the Red Sea, 
deliverance that human eyes had never seen the likes of before. And you think those children that saw that in the parents, they're going to give Dylan, they're going to make sure they teach the song of Moses to their children and keep going the way that God would have them. No. They strike up the music and dancing. They lose their apparel and they ate and drank and rose up to play. And down they went to debauchery that happened so fast. You think there's no way that could happen. When this stuff is in the mix, don't overestimate what the flesh can do. Or, in other words, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So Leviticus 19, look with me at verse number 29. <clears throat> he says, Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore. And you think, whoa, that phrase is just, yipes, that is so descriptive and just strips away the veneer. He said, Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. And you look around America, that's exactly what happened. Back in the 1907, down in Storyville, where jazz was born, and this, the term is so vile, uh, I don't even feel like I should even explain where it came from, but it's vile. You can ask me afterward if you don't already know. But where jazz music was born, in the Storyville, the French Quarter of New Orleans with a heavy Roman Catholic influence, and here comes a stride-style piano playing like the saloon style you see in the old westerns, and here comes bestiality and sodomy and stuff in 1907. So it went for 10 years from 1907 to 1917. There was so much disease, the government had to come in and shut them down because it was so vile. And that's where jazz was born. And that's where the stride style piano playing launched out. And again, what did they have there in, in Storyville? Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness. Over 100 years ago, it went down that fast. And let that be a lesson to every single one of us because... Those things can happen. And you think, well, no way, I'm not going to go that way. But if you put your life in neutral, the next generation's children, grandchildren, they could absolutely go that way. And you think, I hope it wouldn't. It will. Just plan on it. It will, unless every day we take this book in, we read it, we teach it to our children. And just like God told the nation Israel, when you rise up throughout the day and when you pillow your head, having that book constantly going through and reminding you, and musing, take some good music and help it remind you what Christ did for you and allow yourself to keep your eyes on the prize because it is worth it to be able to set that affection on things above and help your children know what those goals are. But the toxic influences are extremely powerful. So I'm not just here to tell you women need to wear modest apparel and men need to watch where their eyes are going. And men, I mean, even men, modest apparel is a good thing to talk about for men. Because men are tempted. You look at the mannequins or something at the store, and what do they do? They squeeze really tight here and try to show off a little extra flex that some people have or some people used to have. That's not the direction we want to go. We don't want people looking at the outward flesh. We want that hidden man of the heart to shine forth, not you know, unbutton and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, all those things, we need to be careful because that can be a stumbling block to either gender. And we all know these things. It's not like I'm telling you anything you don't know. But just as a reminder, and as I see the way Satan sneaks in, we don't have to be ignorant as advice. We can learn and win as we take this book and put it into practice because our children and grandchildren and their grandchildren's children are worth investing in now. And the time we take in this book and treat it with reality and so soberness, just like the young men, they were exhorted in Titus to be sober-minded. And Satan doesn't want young men to be sober-minded. But a young man, teen him to be sober-minded, to understand God's word. And that young man can be in preparation as he allows himself to be adorned with the doctrine. And he grows. You might meet a gal that's like-minded as they grow together. And then the children can grow together. And right away, you start having people who are able to take the position of elder, bishop, and deacon. They learn how to train. They learn how to rule their house well and train them and lead them and guide them and say to those children in the family, be ye followers of me as I also am of Christ. And you start seeing families fortified and assemblies fortified. And there should be, hopefully God willing, you know all these precious little children that you see, I don't want one single one of them to be shipwrecked. And I want all of them to take off from a strong launch pad and just keep on going for the greatest glory of God and not one of them lost. It's not like there's a surplus. We just, oh, well, a couple of them went away. But I know myself, I need to be in prayer for each one of these little children and in prayer for the parents training the children 
because the children aren't going to learn it if the parents aren't going to learn it. So as an encouragement, I hope it didn't seem like I'm throwing a wet blanket on everyone, but it is serious. There is a battle out there, and they are after the most valuable thing we have. They're after the children. They're after your testimony. And to realize where the opposition is coming and dig into this book and memorize verses. When Christ was tempted, he didn't say, split hoof, you beat it. Get thee hence. He starts quoting, it is written, it is written, it is written. And men and women, when you find out where your temptations are, or your weak points, memorize verses to fortify that weak spot. If there's a break in the fence, if there's the wall is torn down in some place, get back up there with your trowel and fill that thing back in. Be like old, read through Nehemiah. And as they try to fortify and build those walls back up, here comes opposition. Here comes Aunt Sanballat and Uncle Tobiah or, or Grandma that says, ah, oh, you're too narrow-minded or you're too whatever. But they, don't, they might not understand the value to put a hedge of protection. So God willing, every single man, woman, boy, and girl that has come here each year, they can keep on growing in knowledge and the grace of God and no shipwrecks because grandchildren, they need a good solid foundation. And Satan wants to erode that thing and pull it away and God helping each and every one of us, encouraging one another not to be weary in well-doing. It's worth it. And in eternity, it absolutely is worth it. And having children that glorify God here and in the world that is to come. I mean, even thinking about 1 John, it doesn't matter when this flesh lived. And it's a joy to parents seeing their children walking in truth. Whether it was under the law, before the law, or under the grace of God. It's something that can be done by God's power and his might. And I sure am thankful to be able to live in a time period where we have the complete revelation of God. Everything we need. Complete. Everything. It's even more damaging than an AR-10 with a 100-round drum on full auto. Because this book foresees and it can go and do work that no physical weaponry could ever do. It goes inside. It can take out the junk and fortify it with something good. So, All right, well, I'm just going to close in a word of prayer, and I guess we're going to have some more dialogue. Holy Father, we sure do thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring for us so much that you gave us guidelines and you gave us safety nets and you gave us understanding and illustrations of Satan's wiles working. And when people weren't looking to your word and your wisdom, they gave into those wiles and they were taken in, in, in uh, the, uh, the entanglements like Pharaoh was hoping Israel would be entangled in the wilderness. Thank you because of your wisdom, we're able to avoid those things and ideally train and bring up our children the nurture and admonition of the Lord that they can serve you with a fervor and a passion that this world can see as peculiar people and they also could be zealous of good works after they're saved by grace through faith through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We thank you for your fidelity and thank you for so many examples that we don't have to learn the hard way. We can learn the easy way by hearing, believing your word and we pray that we can do those things <clears throat> every day of our life and encourage one another. For Christ Jesus' glory and for his sake forever. Amen.